Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Peter, welcome to another AMA. How are you doing? Very well. How are you? I'm doing good. Any uh, stories you'd like to share before this AMA starts? I asked this question with nothing in particular in mind. I'm just curious if anything jumps out to you. Yeah, okay. That's funny you say that because I was worried that there was something that I didn't know that I was supposed to be aware of, but no, there are no stories to share. Okay. All right. Then with that, we'll get rolling. So today's AMA is going to focus all around one topic, and it's a topic we see questions come through weekly. And it seems like there's a lot of confusion around this topic, and that topic is cancer screening. And ultimately, we see questions around how should I think about cancer screening? Is it important? Is it beneficial? Um, you know, there'll be sometimes articles in the news talking about how cancer screening is beneficial. Others talking about how studies came out and cancer screening is not beneficial. And so I think it just creates a lot of confusion for people around this topic. And so what we decided to do is just gather all these questions for today's AMA and just kind of go through cancer screening in general. This will be, you know, the cases for and against cancer screening, why some trials may show benefit while others don't, what more modalities do people have and what are the different options for cancer screening, including the pros and cons of each of them. And then also what should people think about when they get cancer screened, whether it's within traditional guidelines or what we're seeing more so now is even if people are paying out of pocket outside of traditional guidelines. And so I think it will be really good. I think at times it can get a teeny bit technical, um, but I also think that's the price you have to pay to really understand how to think about this. So all that said, anything you want to add before we get started? No. Nope. First question. <laughs> Perfect. So I think it'll be really helpful to set the stage for people understanding how common is a cancer diagnosis. And then from there, how common is it for someone who gets diagnosis to die from cancer? I think that would be helpful for people to understand, you know, why it's worth putting the time and effort into understanding this topic at a deeper level. Yeah. So, you know, I remember when I was training, um, you always wanted to keep things sort of simple. And um, so the really simple heuristic that we used to keep in mind, which you'll see in a moment when I provide more detail, um, is actually not perfectly correct, but is reasonable, is that a, a person in the US has a, a lifetime incidence of cancer about one in three, and about half the time it's going to be fatal. So one in three chance of getting cancer in your lifetime, one in six chance of dying. Now, it turns out that that's an underestimate. Uh, so what are the most recent numbers? The most recent numbers are that men have a lifetime incidence of just under 41%. Um, and indeed, about half of those are fatal. So 20.2% lifetime risk of dying from cancer. For women, the numbers are slightly better. 39.1% lifetime risk of cancer diagnosis, with just under half of those being fatal. 17.7%. So again, the, the, the adage that it was one third, one sixth, you could see is, a, is an underestimate there. Um, I think a more relevant way to look at this, though, is not just to look at it through that lens, which, by the way, people have probably heard me say many times, and I certainly talk about it in the book, uh, cancer is the second leading cause of death um, in the United States and globally, second, of course, only to uh, ASCVD. Um, but I think it's probably more... Um, maybe insightful to compare this through decades of life. Um, and, and rather than just have me rattle these off, let's pull up the first table, Nick. Um, I will, of course, rattle these numbers off because I know that there are people who are only listening to us. Um, but this, this certainly sets the stage. So um, the way this table is organized, of course, um, is by decade. So we're looking at people aged, you know, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, et cetera, um, all the way up to 85 and plus. And we're looking at kind of three things. So the first is what percentage of deaths in that decade are attributed to cancer? Then we're looking at the actual rate of cancer death. So how many, and this is always done in deaths per 100,000. Um, so what is the number of deaths per 100,000? And what is the rank of cancer relative to other types of death within that decade? 
And for the cases where cancer is not number one, what is number one? So with that said, let's start at the lowest end of the spectrum, right? This is lowest in terms of lowest mortality, because the, the number you really want to anchor to is what's the absolute death rate, and that's going to be in how many cases per 100,000. So in that first decade, we compare in the ages of you know, 25 to 34, um, cancer accounts for eight deaths per 100,000 individuals. Not many people, fortunately, are dying that young. Uh, it represents six percent of total deaths ranking third. So there are two things that rank significantly higher and not surprisingly, the number one cause of death in that demographic is accidental death. Um, and of course, we've talked about this before, accidental death, the number one cause of that is hands down overdose death. Okay, so you go up to the next category, 35 to 44, the percent of deaths attributed to cancer goes up from 6 to 13%, and the rate of death goes up threefold, goes to 26 deaths per 100,000. It is still the third leading cause of death, um, trailing accidental death, again, the leading cause of death. And again, tragically, that turns out to be overdoses as well. So we go into the next decade. This is where I sit plumply, 45 to 54. Here, cancer now accounts for 23% of all deaths in someone my age. Um, the rate of cancer deaths, again, jumps sharply from 26 to now 88 per 100,000. And it technically ranks second, um, although I put a little asterisk here because here is where cancer and ASCVD are constantly switching with each other. So I would say it kind of ranks first or second here, and it's either ASCVD or cancer that are in the number one spot. And then accidents tends to fall to number three here. So you go one decade up, 55 to 64, the percentage of deaths attributed to cancer is now almost a third. It's 30% of deaths. And by the way, this is almost the maximum share of cancer deaths you'll see. Um, it now rises to the number one cause of death in that age group, and it now accounts for 267 deaths per 100,000. So this is a very big number. Um, go up another decade, and it basically is the same story. It's 31% of deaths attributed. It is the leading cause of death, and it now has doubled to 553 deaths per 100,000. So now you've made it to the age of 75, what happens? Well, it turns out that other diseases are kind of exploding. And so cancer now falls to second. Again, ASCVD takes over, but cancer still accounts for a quarter of deaths, but the absolute rate continues to rise. It doubles again to 1,036 deaths per 100,000 people. Again, ASCVD is number one, and when you go out past 85, ASCVD holds on to its number one spot, and cancer takes the number three spot. It tends to fall, although its absolute numbers go up. 1,649 deaths per 100,000 falls to 12% share. So here, a neurodegenerative disease tends to come up and take that place of cancer. So again, um, you know, why do I go through all of those stats? Well, I think the point I'm trying to make here is there's there's really no decade of life in which cancer is not at least top three causes of death. And by extension, then, I guess anybody listening to this is probably thinking of cancer. The other thing I would say is it would be impossible to listen to this and not know someone who has either battled cancer or who has outright died of cancer. Yeah, Peter, I think that's really good for people to kind of to see decade by decade just how prevalent it is and start to see how, you know, once you hit that 45 plus range, you know, it starts to become much more relevant, which is the vast majority of people listening to this. And so I think the next question then is, how does cancer screening fit into this, right? So why is cancer screening something important for people to think about if hearing that their goal is to not die early from cancer? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we want to sort of take a step back and compare again cancer to ASCVD. So, you know, it, it shouldn't be lost on anybody that ASCVD is the leading cause of death at this point. Um, but, you know, we understand what drives ASCVD so well. We really understand the relationship between um, lipoproteins hypertension, smoking, and metabolic health. And those are basically the big four drivers of 
ASCVD. And there, there are certainly genetic things in there that one has to pay attention to, such as LP little a, familial hypercholesterolemia, and things like that. But again, those tend to be relegated down into issues that, that can be managed pharmacologically. Um, and so, in other words, we have a clear understanding of how that disease progresses, and we can monitor a person's progress towards that disease. We have the biomarkers that predict risk. Furthermore, we have tools like CT angiograms that allow us to at least somewhat grossly look at the anatomy of the coronary arteries and get a sense of how advanced disease might be. So when it comes to cancer, you know, none of that's really true, right? Outside of smoking, um, and, and, and as we'll talk about, you know, certain genetic conditions, poor metabolic health, it's still a little bit of a black box as to why people get cancer. Um, and more importantly, what one can do to reduce risk. So, you, you know, we've talked at length about the things that one can do to reduce risk and we won't, we won't, um, you know, re rehash that here. But what we have to acknowledge is that we have two things working against us in the cancer equation that we have working for us in the heart disease equation. So one is just that, right? We have a far uh, less command over the biology of the disease. Secondly, we have far fewer effective treatments for the disease once it is advanced. So I think the easiest way to kind of understand that is to look at both five and 10 year survival curves. So we pulled these up for just a couple of the most common cancers out there. In fact, these are the five leading causes of cancer death and, no, and only, you know, only in alphabetical order. So not uh, the rank, of course, goes lung first and, and pancreatic would be the lowest in the top five. But the point I want to make here is when you look at five year survival, you look at this in two stages, you look at what we consider are early stage one, stage two. So this is regional cancer, or local cancer actually hasn't even spread to a lymph node. You look at stage three, which is the cancer has spread to a lymph node, but no further. And you look at stage four, which is to say this cancer has now left the lymph node and gone to a distant site. And so you can see that um, in breast cancer, by the way, we, we always think about this in two forms. We think about um, HER2 nu positive and negative, estrogen receptor positive and negative, and triple negative. And um, if anybody needs a refresher on that, we have a, a great podcast we did on breast cancer that explains why these are three basically very different diseases. But you can see the difference in survival between all of these cancers at an early stage where it ranges from 92 to 100% stage one, two survival to stage four, where you have metastatic disease, it's 13 to 40%. So significant difference. And by the way, those are much better numbers than they used to be. Breast cancer is probably one of the bigger success stories um, of the past 20 years in terms of stretching out median survival. When you look at colorectal cancer, if it's, you know, a colorectal cancer that is caught before it's gone to the lymph nodes, we're talking about 88% for five years survival. If it's gone to lymph nodes, that goes down to 70%. And if it's spread to the liver, it's down to 16%. Um, lung cancer ranges from 59% early to 6% late. Prostate is 100% early, 33% if it spreads. And of course, the worst of all of these is pancreatic. If you can at least catch it in stage one, stage two, it's 38% five-year survival versus 3% if it's distant. I won't go through the same analysis for 10 year survival for the sake of time, but we'll include the table so that people can see. The only thing I'd point out is, of course, the trends are even more dramatic when you start to go to 10 year survival. In other words, the difference between stage one and stage two survival versus stage four survival at 10 years is even a bigger chasm. So why do I bring this all up? Well, I bring this up to say that despite all of the advances we've had in the past 20 years, and clearly hormone therapy for breast cancer and immunotherapy for a number of other cancers, particularly checkpoint inhibitors, um, still leave us with a lot to be desired, especially when it comes to late stage cancer. And I think that just leaves anyone who thinks about this realizing if you're going to get cancer, you certainly do not want to be in the position where that diagnosis is being made once the cancer is advanced, once the cancer has had a chance to spread. You really want to be able to diagnose cancer and manage it when it's in the stage one, stage two phase. And then, Peter, I think that leads to 
One of the questions that we get asked about by far the most, which is people reading stories, reading studies, and really wondering, do clinical trials on cancer screening show any benefits in reducing cancer deaths? Yeah, well, this is this is really the crux of what we're here to talk about today, because this this has become a controversial topic. Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a premium member. It's extremely important to me to provide all of this content without relying on paid ads. To do this, our work is made entirely possible by our members. And in return, we offer exclusive member-only content and benefits above and beyond what is available for free. So if you want to take your knowledge of this space to the next level, it's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Premium membership includes several benefits. First, comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing that we discuss in each episode. And the word on the street is, nobody's show notes rival ours. Second, monthly Ask Me Anything or AMA episodes. These episodes are comprised of detailed responses to subscriber questions, typically focused on a single topic and are designed to offer a great deal of clarity and detail on topics of special interest to our members. You'll also get access to the show notes for these episodes, of course. Third, delivery of our premium newsletter, which is put together by our dedicated team of research analysts. This newsletter covers a wide range of topics related to longevity and provides much more detail than our free weekly newsletter. Fourth, access to our private podcast feed that provides you with access to every episode, including AMAs, sans the spiel you're listening to now, and in your regular podcast feed. Fifth, the Qualies, an additional member-only podcast we put together that serves as a highlight reel featuring the best excerpts from previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and listen to each one of them. And finally, other benefits that are added along the way. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can also find me on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, all with the handle peteratiamd. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you use. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take all conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of all disclosures. Mm-hmm.